knowledge of statistics expands my little spiel on statistics in context is going to be more and more meaningful. So I'm just going to keep trying the same spiel as the semester continues on. And I hope that the spiel will become more meaningful as we go. I'm going to use that as an opportunity to lead us into histograms. Histograms are a type of plot that we have not yet seen before. Um, they're not Okay, they're really common, but I'm not a huge fan of them. Um, I prefer density plots. And you guys have seen density plots before. They're very related. So it shouldn't be too new for us to pick up histograms. Um, so we'll do histograms. I'll introduce a few new keywords, and all of it is going to build to one of the most important topics of applied statistics, the central limit theorem. So that's what we are going to do for the day. And then the rest of the week is actually all about the central limit theorem. I'm trying to give us as many different viewpoints, as many different angles on the central limit theorem as I can, so that you can hopefully grasp one of the um, views of the central limit theorem, attach yourself to that and get a better understanding of it. There's a lot of ways to think about it. So hopefully one of the many ways we'll think about it throughout this week will help us understand it. And then we can start building our understanding to the rest. Um, yeah, of course, before I jumped into the outline, I was going to ask if there was any questions and it looked like, looks like we already have one. Uh, follow-up question from Discord. So Hayes, take it away. So I know we're supposed to be sending you like the photos and stuff, but should we send you like a link to a Google Drive? Because I know like sometimes if the files are too big, like you can't email them. Right. I haven't thought about what I was going to do for that yet. Um, my best guess was going to create a Google Drive folder for, for you and then just give you access to upload it. And I was gonna do that for every student. So I think I was gonna do the same idea you have, but I was gonna create the folders just so I could keep them organized how I want instead of having every student send me a completely differently organized folder, <laughs> which would have been a disaster. Uh, does that seem fine to everybody that's at least here? to submit your uh, course notes and tutorials for the semester. If I created like a Google folder, thanks Andre, if I created a Google folder that um, you and I have access to, but no other students in the class have access to, um, then you could upload your materials into that. Yeah, and Colin, you're right. There are gonna be some details behind it. So maybe what I could do is like, um, pick on Colin just because <laughs> you're the first to say something and uh, try it, you know, set up the Google Drive folders, email Colin, ask Colin, did this work? If it didn't, then try some more things. Um, and then, thanks Colin, I appreciate, appreciate you letting me pick on you. Um, and then, tinker with it until it does work. Abdullah, I absolutely hate Blackboard. So no, Blackboard is not going to be easier than for me. Um, great, Colin, thanks. Let's, uh, let's jump on it early and try to tackle it Wednesday in office hours. Abdullah, if you prefer Blackboard, then I offer my apologies, but nothing more, because I do not want to work with Blackboard as much as possible. So I avoid it, which is why I put all course materials up on my website instead of in Blackboard. I don't know what Blackboard is like for you all on your end, but on my end to do anything, to even post like one file, you have to go through like a hundred clicks. You click here and then click there and then confirm that and then click next and confirm that and then click next and confirm that. And to post one file is really obnoxious. So I don't do it at all. Um, other questions before we jump into this uh, rest of the day. Okay, thanks. I'm glad it doesn't bother you going through my website and a Google Drive folder. I appreciate the flexibility. That's helpful to me, thank you. Other questions before we get going?
good. I'm glad you think so. I uh, appreciate the support on the on the statement that I also like. Um, did y'all see my update to the um, lecture notes? Did everybody see my update to the lecture notes? Is this helpful? This was a suggestion that came in in office hours on Friday, and I really liked it. So um, I just did it without asking anybody else, but hopefully organizing a hundred times better. That's fantastic. Um, hopefully it helps you to scroll less. Um, I haven't looked into why bullet points don't show up over here for each of these topics, but you know what? It's still a hundred times better. Uh, so maybe it could be like 200 times better if there was bullet points over here, but um, so far, I think this is much better for everyone. So thanks so much to that uh, recommendation. Okay, then that's enough delaying. We're just going to dive in and start statistics in context. Okay, so lots of this is going to start out the same as we have seen before. There's kind of like two sides to statistics. There's a distribution side, which we're going to start renaming to highlight a specific point. Distributions live on one side of the world of statistics, but oftentimes people refer to this side of statistics as the population. There is some population out there that you are interested in knowing things like the mean or quantiles or variances or probabilities with respect to. You're interested in knowing things about the population. So a, an example of a population could be like a single coin. You're interested in knowing what is the probability of observing heads from a single coin. Now, theoretically, the only way to find that out is to repeatedly flip the coin an infinite number of times. There is theoretically an infinite number of times you could flip a coin. And if you could flip the coin an infinite number of times, then you would know everything there is to know about that coin. You would say something like, you know all information possible about the population of coin flips for that particular coin. So that example, while tangible, I don't really think gives you an understanding of why they have named it the population. And so a better way to understand the word population is to think about there exists a population of people in the US. And that population of people has various distributions associated with them, like um, their height is uh, of all US adults, the population of all US adults, their heights makes up one distribution. So maybe you have a distribution of heights that looks something like this. And it happens to be fairly normal because uh, that's the way the world works. Heights happen to be distributed fairly normally. And they have some mean right in the middle. And the mean is like, I don't know, maybe five feet, 10 inches, something like that. And there's a variance that describes the width and whatnot. Okay, well, there's also the, for the population of US adults, there's also a distribution that describes their income. And now income can't go below zero and it has a long right tail because there's people like Bill Gates who make way more money than any of the rest of us ever will. And all of the rest of us kind of fit in right in the middle here. There's some bulk of people that make a reasonable amount of money like the rest of us. And then um, in the long way off 
towards Never Never Land. There is like Bill Gates and um, all the people who own NBA teams and all the other executives of high tech companies and whatnot. So they name the population of things we're interested in a population because it often represents people, but it doesn't have to represent people. Um, there's a question in the chat. Could you say it is a population of data points or would that be the other side of stats? That would be the other side of stats. So the way statistics works is in order to learn about the population, you sample data. And theoretically, you're supposed to randomly sample so that you can learn um, about people who are both short and tall and everything in between. If you randomly sample, then you're theoretically going to get representation from the entire sample space. If you randomly sample, you will theoretically get representation from the entire sample space. If you randomly sample, you'll get really rich people, people in middle incomes, and people in low incomes, and everything in between. Now, instead, if you only sampled people with um, cell phones, for instance, then you might be getting some sort of like middle income people, but not very representative low income people if you only sampled people based on cell phone numbers. So theoretically, to learn about these populations, which are described by distributions, we randomly sample, and then you obtain a sample. And so the other side of statistics is the data side. Uh, let me do this like this, is the data side. And we actually call it sample data, or they might say a sample data set or they might say just a sample. So it's like making a noun out of the action of randomly taking information from the population. The action is sampling. And once you have a subset of the population, you have a collection of data points like Hayes is asking in the chat. Once you have a collection of data points, you call it a sample. So the other side of the world is the sample side, which is just your data. And maybe you have a sample of size N. You have capital N data points. That is the sample side. And so what we're slowly starting to learn is you can take the mean of your data, which in math notation, I will draw a tilde underneath it to remind you that this is supposed to be a vector of data, a vector of length capital N of data. And what we're going to start getting to is that this sample side calculation approximates the population side integrals. This sample side calculation is actually approximating the population side expectations. Okay, there's another question in the chat. Uh, so is the right side ca called population distributions or is it either population or distributions? Uh, let me rephrase the question again, and then I'll show you why I just drew these slashes here now. The question is, is the right side called the population or distributions or population distributions? And the answer is yes. In different contexts, different people will refer to the right-hand side in all three ways you could think of. Sometimes they will call it just the population. Sometimes they will refer to it as a population distribution. Sometimes they will just refer to the distributions themselves and they will mean the population distributions, but they would just say distributions. So really any combination you come up with between population and distributions, 
either by themselves or together is accurate. And the language there is frustrating because it's almost too loose. If you were just told one thing, it would be much more easy, but unfortunately that's not what happens. And the same story goes with the sample side. Sometimes people refer to it as just the sample. Sometimes people will refer to it as sample data. And sometimes people ref will refer to it just as the data. So you could say sample, or separately, you could just say data, or you could say sample data. And in either of those cases, you're referring to the left side. Good question. Uh, apologies for the vagueness of the discipline, but unfortunately, that's what we have to deal with. And that is exactly what we're getting at, Jake. The next question in the chat is exactly what my notation down here is supposed to indicate. The sample mean, that is this side, the sample mean, the mean calculated on just data is approximating the population mean, which is an expectation. The sample mean approximates the population mean, and you only need data to make that approximation. We have been doing that in this class in R for the last few weeks. More theoretically, it's technically a limit. Theoretically, it's technically a limit that if your sample size went off to infinity, then you would know exactly the expectation. If your sample size went off to infinity, then you would know exactly the expectation. And now the logic is, if you collected all US adults, if you collected every member of the population, then you would know the exact population mean of US adults heights. If you had every person in the population, you would know what the exact mean is. You wouldn't need to randomly sample and then calculate the mean. You'd have the mean in hand. And that's what the limit is supposed to represent. That if you could get your hands on all the data from the entire population, then you wouldn't need the sample side at all. But chances are good you're never going to get every member of the population because either it's too expensive to collect or you're too lazy or it's literally impossible to get all the data. Okay, so, so do we have to worry about during the, the process of data collection if if we collect uh, let's up to a certain point and we don't have all the every person in the United States but a certain fraction of the people that the data is going to be biased towards, let's say, tall people before we get to a certain point or short people or anything in between up to a point. And then all of a sudden the population is going to explode with everybody else, you know? And so how do we know mm -hmm. that we have enough coverage of data to make these kinds of assumptions? Yeah, excellent question. Um, the, your intuition is spot on. The frustrating part is most of the time, you rely on this keyword, randomly sample. So a lot okay. of the art, a lot of the art, A-R-T, as if like you don't know how to do it perfectly. A lot of the art of statistics is about taking appropriate samples so as to minimize the bias in your sample. Now, unfortunately, this class doesn't have a lot to say about that, and we just kind of fall back on the word random. But there is a, an entire sub-discipline of statistics about how to um, not overly sample really short people or really tall people and miss everybody in between. Okay, thank you. Yeah, now the short answer to your question is since the limit um, is valid mathematically, and that's like part of what we're going to talk about this week. Theoretically, you just need a bigger sample, and most of the issues will go away. But that's not always possible um, to just take more data. Just taking more data is sometimes way too expensive. So um, there's various ways to try to deal with it, but in general, it's like a whole nother class. We have an entire class devoted to how to properly sample. Um, which brings up a good point. 
uh, I sent out a Discord and a Piazza link about Math 450. If you all are even somewhat interested in a math minor, and I highly encourage you to be interested in a math minor because you guys are so close. This entire class had to take Calc 1 and Calc 2, and then this math class, you're so close to a math minor. I encourage you to sign up for Math 450. It's a follow-up from this course that normally depends on a uh, second semester of this course, but we're teaching it special next semester because um, I think just for fun, to be honest, I think this last year was just so difficult that uh, Dr. Kathy Gray decided in the fall she wanted to do something more exciting. So she's doing a special version of Math 450 where you do not need the follow-up to this course in order to get into 450. If you just email her and ask to be enrolled, she's going to, uh, she'll let you into Math 450. And I really like what she's doing this semester. It's um, Bayesian statistics. I'll type that into the chat, but it's actually where all of my research falls itself. Bayesian statistics. Oh, <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that Math 350 is getting us, getting some of us a, um, a math minor. Okay, so we are going to move into the world of histograms. And I'm going to show you on the picture we have. Good to hear, Devin. <laughs> woo, woo, math miners. Um, oh, man. I typed Bayesian statistics just to one person, not to everybody. Um, I'm going to show you on the picture we have currently working what a histogram looks like, and then we'll just go into R and make some. So we get a little break of me talking uh, and drawing pictures. Instead, I'm going to make R draw you pictures. So a histogram is just a bin representation of a population's density function. So this is a histogram. You create these numeric bins of some width, and then you just count the number of observations, the number of data points in each bin, and you draw the bin to the height of however many data points there are in that bin. OK, so let's try. Histograms for a single numeric variable. They are a representation of the density function using only data. And that is a sample of data. Okay. Histograms for a single numeric variable, doesn't matter if the random variable is discrete or continuous. And it essentially tries to replicate using these bins, the density function of that random variables distribution. So I'm gonna go get some data from this a website that I've posted up on my um, website. I'm going to start with this spam data set down here at the bottom. Let's make things bigger, but not too big, apparently. Uh, okay, I'm going to start with this spam data set. I'm going to click the CSV. I'm going to click raw. You all have done this before. And this is being recorded, so I'm going to move fairly quickly through this. 
I'm going to open up our studio. And then I'm going to paste in that link. Now, I don't expect you all to type along and keep up with all of this. In fact, I encourage you just to watch and look at the pretty pictures. And then once we get an understanding of the pictures, if you wanna come back and look at the exact code, I will post this file of our code onto my website, or you can come back and replay the recording. So if you recall from the data set that I just named email, that looks better. From the data set that I just named email, there is a variable named spam contained within it. And the variable named spam contains ones and zeros only. So this is the easiest example of a histogram. There are two bins. Each one of these gray boxes is called a bin. In this example, there are two bins. And this bin consists of only zeros. Now the bins are supposed to have some width, but because there's only zeros and ones in here, it just defaulted to a bin of basically zeros and then a second bin of just ones. So in the bin consisting of just zeros, we have counted the number of zeros in the variable named spam and we represent the number of zeros on the y-axis. So in this case, it looks to be some number a little bit greater than 1,500. And the second bin consists of just ones. And here, I don't know, it's some other number of ones. You can get an exact count of the zero and ones using a table. And that's in fact all this histogram is doing in this case. In the case that there's just zeros and ones, this histogram is essentially just what this table is doing. It's counting up how many zeros you have and makes a bar of that height. And it's counting up how many ones you have and it makes a bar of that height. Okay, how is a histogram for a, bino uh, for a Bernoulli variable? Any questions? Okay, good. That one wasn't so bad. So let's start building in more details of a histogram. And we will do so by getting a different data set now. Okay, so this time I'm gonna go up to the top and in this folder, DS Labs, I'm gonna pick out a data set named Admissions. Now this data set is about how many students were admitted into uh, various majors at UC Berkeley. So all of the majors are concealed so that we don't know which major is which. So major A, men, 62 males were admitted to major A out of the 825 applicants. Is everyone okay with that? Into major B, there was 63 males admitted out of the 560 applicants. Okay, so while I read this data set into R, who wants to take a guess at what kind of data we are looking at here? We know the answer, but it's tough to see. Is it Bernoulli? Close. What's the one where you count up some number of Bernoullis? Is it binomial? It is binomial. This is an example. Sorry, where'd it go? This is an example of binomial data. There are like, think of it like this. There's 825 coin flips, and only 62 of them showed up heads for this major. This is an example of a binomial data set. 
there are 560 coin flips. Each coin flip is a new individual applying to that specific major. <laughs> and this number, the number admitted, is the number of successes, the number of heads you saw out of your coin flip. This is binomial data, but it's hard to see. Okay, so I'm going to do basically the same thing. I've named the data set admissions. And then using the dollar sign operator, I'm going to extract the column named admitted. And I'm going to make a histogram out of that. And now the lesson we're supposed to learn here about histograms is that histograms adapt naturally, automatically adapt to the values you have in your data set. Notice that this histogram now contains bins that go from zero to, now it looks like it's marked 20, but actually this bin goes up to 20 and the one just below it starts at, at everything above 20. Okay, so the next bin, this taller one, starts at everything above 20 and goes up to 40. So if you were to think about this in terms of intervals, you could type out question mark hist, pull up the help file, and then I already know this because I've looked at these many times, but I'm showing you that in this help file, if you scroll down to the details section, it tells you that all of the bins it creates are of this form. The left value is excluded, the lower value is excluded, and the right value is included. The left endpoint, the smaller value is excluded, and the bigger value is included. So if we come back and look at this plot, that's how I know that this bin right here consists of everything bigger than but not zero, up to 20 included. And this next bin starts at everything excluding 20 and goes up to including 40. This next bin, notice this bin has zero data points in it. It is the bin that goes from everything above 40 to inclusive of 60. There are zero data points in this bin. That is the histogram naturally, automatically adapting to your data. This bin right here starts at everything above 60 and including 80. And there are, I don't know, two data points in this bin. And this last bin here has only one data point apparently or something like that. Um, and it goes from everything above 80 to including 100. Hey, is when you have two brackets, both the lower endpoint and the uh, upper endpoint are inclusive. But when you have a uh, parenthesis, you are excluding that value. Does that make sense? That answers your question? Yeah, I just couldn't remember if it was the square brackets that meant inclusive or not. Square means inclusive, parenthesis mm -hmm. means exclusive. Okay, thank you. Totally. Okay, here we go. So we are learning that histograms automatically adapt to your data to give you the best representation of the density from which your data came. Histograms automatically adapt to your data, that is the sample side, to give you the best representation for the population from which your data came. This comes back to statistics in, cont in context here. Statistics is using the data on the left-hand side to learn about the population distribution. Okay, so let's try one more data set. Um, I decided this next one, we should be more fun and we should go look at the data set about penguins. I actually chose this data set because it's uh, a good histogram 
and it shows you what you should never do with your variable names. You should never put the units in your variable names. And the short reason for why is because it makes typing in any programming language a pain. Oh, did I miss a question above Jake's? Oh, the statement, I'm confused on the x-axis. Jake, what do you want me to say is that? Is the x-axis showing the amount of students admitted while the frequency is showing how often that many students are admitted? Oh, okay. But the x-axis, uh, thanks Hayes, thanks Jake for uh, flagging my attention to the question. The x-axis is the number of students admitted. And the y-axis is how many times a student, uh, how many students were admitted in that quantity. So if you think about the number of admitted students, for the binomial data we just saw, you could do something like this, max admissions, what was, did I misspell admissions? Okay, theoretically, there was a max of 825 students uh, applied to any of these majors. Fair enough. So this is grouping together students by how many were admitted. So it's essentially saying there's two applicants who were admitted within a bin of zero to 20 people who could have been admitted. No, so this is two students were admitted for the bin consisting of zero to 20. Two students were admitted within the bin that represents zero to 20 admissions. Let's see, this one is five, six, seven. Seven students were admitted into the bin that represents 20 to 40. Okay. The next one I'm picking out is about penguins. This one should be easier to interpret. Make a histogram the same way we've been doing before. Name the data set. And then what do we say? I wanted to do body mass. So here is another histogram automatically adapting to the data set in question to give you a representation of the distribution from which these data came. This bin right here represents penguins. That way, I don't know where it starts because the graph isn't well labeled, but anyway, it represents something like 2,500 to 3,000. So this is penguins whose body mass in grams is 2,500 to 3,000 grams. And there's some, I don't know, 10 or so, maybe 12 penguins whose body mass is 2,500 to 3,000 grams. This one is there's like uh, 65 penguins, something like 65 penguins whose body mass is 3,000 to 3,500. You can see that the majority of penguins weigh something between 3,500 and 4,000 grams. Okay, histograms. We are going to use these yes 
there is a way to draw a density curve over a histogram, because in fact, all a density curve is, is just basically connecting the midpoints of all of the bins. And I think you have to go like this. Okay, this is a bad example for the question you asked, Jake, because there are missing data in the example. See all of these missing data? That is making my example for the density curve not work well. I don't know of an easy way to get rid of that uh, without confusing you all. That's not super helpful. I will try to come up with a more obvious solution that shows you how to do this. Um, and present it to you all on like Discord and or Piazza. But for now, that does do what you want, but it's not super helpful for various reasons. So um, Jake, there's an answer. It's a bad answer. I recognize that. And I will seek to give you all a better answer to this good question. OK, next up, we're going to talk about the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is the most um, important, probably the most important theorem of applied statistics. And it goes like this. Theoretically, this is a vector of data from a population that was randomly sampled. This vector of data was obtained randomly. Because the data was obtained randomly, if someone else went out and sampled data from the same population, but took their own random sample, they would probably get different data because the data are random. If the data are random, then calculating some statistic like a mean from the vector of data will give you a different answer for each new random sample. Because the data are random, you should think of the mean as random. That's the hardest part of the central of understanding the central limit theorem. Because the data are randomly sampled, you should think of the mean as randomly sampled. Now, obviously, this highlighted vector of data is just a fixed data set. And no matter how many times you calculate the mean on it, you will only ever get the same number. But the idea is, if you took a random sample of penguins, and then I took a random sample of penguins, and then Jake took a random sample of penguins, we three would get different data sets. Each data set would give us a different mean. OK, so let's see if we can simulate that in R. So let's say we're all going to take samples of size 301. I'm just making it up. And let's say we're going to sample from a binomial distribution that represents a fair coin flipped 10 times. And let's say there's 500 samples. The idea looks like this. If you take our binome to generate random data, here is a sample of data. Because it's 
a representation of a fair coin flipped 10 times, and then you count the number of heads, there's mostly numbers near five in here. But if we did this again, and R stopped yelling at us, we would get all new data. Another way to see that is if we just took the mean immediately, instead of looking at the data itself, every time we resampled, we would get new data. The mean is always going to be close to five for this distribution because we are looking at the average value you would get from flipping a fair coin 10 times. And you're mostly going to get numbers near five because that's what the expectation is. But the trick is, what happens if you just did this 500 times? So this is almost like you and 499 of your friends each took a sample of size 301. So our binome produces a vector of length 301. Hayes, this is my answer to your question. Our binome produces a vector of length 301. We then calculate a mean of the vector that is length 301. And then we replicate that process, capital R times. So notice in the end, we have 491, 492, 493, 494, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 500 means. Okay, you ready for the coup de gras? The coup de gras is this. The central limit theorem tells us the histogram of the sample means is approximately normal. The histogram of the sample means is approximately normal. Uh, Jake, your question, as it's stated, doesn't make any sense. Sorry. You can take the mean of a single number and you just get out that number. I think your question is, can we take the mean of the sample means? Sure, of course you can. So it's 1050. I have given you the crux of the central limit theorem. The rest of this week is videos about practicing this exact concept. And I have uh, written material for you to look at. I have interactive material for you to look at. And I have R code examples for you to look at. And I will say one more time before 1050 is over, the central limit theorem for the sample mean dictates that the histogram of many sample means will look normal. The central limit theorem for the sample mean dictates that the histogram of many sample means will look approximately normal. Okay, I'm going to stop recording here.